100 million euros. That is a lot of money. In 2013, Gareth Bale became the first ever football player to transfer from one club to another for that crazy number. A number that, ironically, was unheard of in a game born from humble working class roots. In fact, prior to 2013, the 70 million mark had only been crossed twice, Cristiano Ronaldo and Zinedine Zidane. And Zidane went for 77 M's in 2001. It's mind-blowing. Since 2013, that 70 million mark has been hit and crossed 51 more times. Since 2016, the 100 million mark has been crossed 16 more times, with five of those coming in 2023 alone. Is this concerning? Just when we think that we've seen it all, year on year, the football transfer market descends further and further into insanity. Shouts of the game being gone can be heard from every home across the globe as money that is absolutely unimaginable to almost every human to ever live, bar a select few, is thrown around. And you want to know what the real kicker is? This is the new norm. Declan Rice goes to Arsenal for 116 million euros. Surely that's outrageous. Nope, that's just what you gotta pay these days. Good business. Harry Kane goes to Bayern Munich for 100 million. Hey man, that's Harry Kane. Brighton demand 120 million pounds for 18-year-old Evan Ferguson. You know what? I'm not surprised. The evolution of the player trading game over time is an interesting one. Supercharged commercial and broadcasting deals continue to create an environment where bigger numbers are expected and the divide between the haves and the have-nots grows by the day. Is all of this a bubble? And if so, is all of this set to burst? Yo, what is going on guys? Hope you're all doing well. I'm Tinashe, welcome back to the channel. We now live in a world where a team that spent 23 years outside the top flight was promoted and spent 200 million euros on new players alone in one year. Why is all of this possible? Well, to figure that out, we gotta dig deep and look into some numbers. That is, of course, after you like and subscribe. Done? Sick. Simply following the money gives us the quickest and most straightforward answer to all of this. Sourced from Deloitte's 2023 annual review of football finance, what we have over here is the estimated size of the entire European football market from 2013 to 2022. That, that right there, that is 29.5 billion euros. A record high. These crazy numbers are propped up by records routinely being broken across the board when it comes to all the relevant revenue streams. Where is all of this money coming from? Well, to be completely honest, so many sources that it's kind of hard to keep track of. But at a very high level, the revenue was a sum of match day sales, broadcasting revenue, sponsorships, and commercial. Merchandising, such as shirt sales and everything in between, fits into commercial. If it weren't obvious, the football industry is a money printing machine. And there's a reason for that. With hundreds of games every single weekend and a strong and growing built-in audience, the football industry has become a media goldmine. Everyone, at the very least, touched a football when they were younger, the game is easy to understand and engage with, and it never ends. As players come and go, clubs remain. The first time I watched Manchester United play, Mark Bosnich was in goal. Now, he didn't last too long, but my affection and attention towards this club did nothing but grow. And now, here I am, over two decades later, depressed. And I keep coming back for more. Going back to this chart, we see that the traditional big five leagues account for about 60% of the market share. And if we go even deeper and focus on 21-22, we'll notice where all the money is really coming from. 51% of overall revenue across the board in the top five leagues stems from broadcasters forking out boatloads to secure the rights to show games on their respective platforms. And with the continued rise of streaming services, it's unlikely that these figures will drop anytime soon. So at a very high level, we know where the money is coming from. Let's dive into where the true divide lies. England. This is home to the final boss of football leagues. Ladies and gentlemen, the difference in revenue between the Premier League and the rest. 
It's honestly frightening, alarming if you're a competing league. There is a reason why foreign press is always so critical. The demand for top flight English football is further exemplified through the broadcasting deals that each league is currently on. These guys just dwarf the opposition in every category. And even beyond that, since 2022, the overseas TV rights for the EPL are worth more than the UK rights. Due to a long history of effective marketing, continuous renegotiating of TV rights and very smart splitting of revenue, the league has had access to unprecedented global exposure since its inception in 1992, also known as when football officially began. Everything before that was just a prequel. Lionel Messi has already mastered the current version. He's just chilling in Miami, waiting for football too. The revenue split may be why the league's been able to go so far. 50% is shared equally, 25% is shared based on finishing positions, and the final 25% is shared based on how many of your matches are televised, a facility fee. The disparity in TV revenue between the team that finishes first and the team that finishes last is also probably a lot closer than you may think. In 21-22, Man City made £153 million and 20th place Norwich made £100 million, a 1.5 times multiplier. Contrast that with La Liga, where first place Real Madrid made £133 million versus 20th place Ibar's £41 million a 3.3 times multiplier. Just so I don't get called out for picking on La Liga, Serie A is the closest to the Premier League split with a 2.7 times multiplier between the team that finished first and last. By the way, Bayern Munich won the Bundesliga and earned 10 million euros less from TV revenue than a Norwich side that only managed five wins in the league. Tough. In 2022, the Premier League accounted for almost 50% of the total transfer fee spend throughout all of Europe, with 3 billion euros being spent overall. I'm recording this video on the 23rd of August 2023, and that number has already been surpassed. Okay, we get it. The Premier League is a global superpower, them and a handful of other elite teams. These are the big boys that are splashing 50 M's plus on players. But make no mistake, even though a lot of the money is concentrated towards these bigger teams, the entire market is growing at a crazy rate. And as more money comes into the industry, we'll only see clubs become more cash flush. Of course, ownership funding exists, and that can be a massive boost for teams. But it's not the most sustainable in the long term, unless you have unlimited funds. Man City lost over half a billion in the early stages of Mansour's reign. Everton lost 120 million after Moshiri came in. Financial fair play was brought in to restrict crazy spending and prevent teams from overestimating their financial capabilities. It was also brought in to maintain a competitive balance so that those teams that can just go out and spend crazy sums and then eat those losses don't create an anti-competitive environment. But as we all know, there are loopholes and there are those who simply don't care, allegedly. Organizations all across the world are now heavily invested in European football, both on and off the pitch. Commercial deals, sponsors, all of our collective sanities when it comes to our favorite teams, they all hang in the balance. But how do you go about achieving financial success in this game? Well, that's pretty simple, by winning. Now you may be asking, how do you win? Well, that's, that's also simple. You put the right people in place. Now going even further beyond, in this day and age, how do you go about doing that? You gotta pay up, my G. Cristiano Ronaldo to Real Madrid, in my eyes, is the greatest transfer of all time. Value for performance, value for publicity, value for clutchness. He is the best player to ever play for the most successful European club in the history of the game. Five Ballon d'Ors, four Champions Leagues, and an average of 1.3 goal contributions per game over nine years is just silly. He cost 94 million euros back in 2009 as a 24 year old. Already had a Ballon d'Or to his name, and I remember people going on about how no player could ever justify that price tag. Zhao Felix, his fellow countryman, was 19 in 2019 and cost Atletico Madrid 126 million euros after only playing one full season as a professional. Four years later, the man is still just thought of as a promising young player with heaps of potential. 23 years old, 
and a lot of people have given up hope. Okay, let me be transparent. I'm trying to build a narrative here, so I chose two extreme examples. But even with that sensationalism, I'm pretty sure all of you understand what I'm trying to say. High fees are no longer reserved for just the very best. In fact, high fees are about so much more than just a player's ball skills. Pause. Neymar to PSG is probably the worst value for performance transfer of all time. He is the most expensive player to ever live. 220 million euros. He only played in 49% of the games PSG played in the six years he spent there. He was fantastic in his prime. Third to Messi and Ronaldo, in my opinion, when properly fit. But that lasted about half a season. All the same, the sheer excitement and media coverage that this transfer brought for PSG, while perhaps not translating directly to a monetary return of that level, can't really be overlooked. As a matter of fact, me saying that holds quite a lot of weight. Saudi Arabian club Al Hilal have brains much larger than mine on their payroll. Yet, knowing all of what I just said to be true, they paid 90 M's to PSG for him. The guy is reportedly on 150 million euros per year for them. Listen, if properly fit, he'll probably be the best player in the league. I don't doubt that but it's very clear that they value him for more than just his playing abilities. Maybe his 213 million Instagram followers played a role. His popularity can probably do a lot to help with the washing. But of course, that's not all. The question of the day was, why do players cost so much? A question that has many answers. The lazy answer would be inflation, which is fair enough, as long as we're all on the same page when it comes to real world inflation, and football inflation. Global inflation trackers will usually place the annual change in CPI for the world's biggest economies between 2% and 5%. Last year was, was a bit crazy especially in the UK. In 2019, the Swiss-based International Center for Sports Studies, or CIES, estimated that the annual inflation growth rate on the transfer market between 2014 and 2019 for top five league footballers was 26%. Now, this study was conducted in 2019, right before you know what. Can you all imagine what the numbers would look like today if COVID never happened? More on that in a bit. With that in mind, using what we learned in the previous chapter, we see that football inflation is closely linked to the leaps in revenue that top clubs have been enjoying. But if we really consider football inflation and revenue, and then go even deeper beyond that and look into some of the higher profile signings over the past 20 years, we begin to notice something pretty interesting. Zidane to Real Madrid in 2001 for 77.5 million euros represented 55% of Madrid's revenue that year. Eden Hazard for 100 million in 2019 represented 14%. Andrei Shevchenko to Chelsea in 2006 for 44 million was 20% of their revenue. Romelu Lukaku to Chelsea in 2021 for 115 million was also 20%. Here are a couple more examples from other clubs that paint some pictures. It is a little eye-opening when you look at inflation from this perspective. And yeah, I'm pretty aware that these are the biggest clubs in the world. It looks like I've just handpicked them, which I have. But you also have to remember that these are the whales that are causing the astronomic shifts and waves in the market. I'm aware that it's not as simple as X player costs more because there is more money in the market. A player's age, their contract duration, agent fees, image rights, social status, stats, and much more factor into this. This is just a small list of things that dictate the prices of players nowadays. And those are just amongst the ones we have the capacity to think of. What about all the other factors that aren't available to the public? Public. So that's real inflation when it comes to football. But what about artificial inflation? Now, this one is quite interesting and it ties more into social status and how the masses can sway opinion. And there's probably no better way to exemplify this type of inflation than the infamous market value. Now, be warned, this is a monetary value, but it's not a transfer valuation. A transfer fee has never been paid for Lionel Messi. His transfer value is zero. Yet, he's widely considered the best ever. He has, however, always had a market value. What would he be worth on the market? And listen, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, this is probably the biggest kept secret in the world, but a lot. Probably. To some of you, hearing the words market value will take your mind to one thing, and one thing only. Transfer market. No, no, not the transfer market. No, no. The extremely popular German website, transfermarket.com popular for a reason. 
The site is a one-stop shop for football-related information. Something that started off as a Werder Bremen fan site in 2000 now regularly boasts over a billion page views each month. About half of those are me. In fact, the site is so popular that the largest news and international media outlets, coaches, executives, and owners of the biggest clubs in the world have admitted to paying close attention to the information presented on the site. Now, if you all recall, Bartomeu was flamed for citing this website to just Arthur's selling price to Juventus because it was pretty easy to make fun of Bartomeu considering the state that he left Barcelona in. But at the same time, realistically, so many people are paying attention to what's on this website. It's it's quite crazy. In 2019, Ronaldo's market value on the website dropped from 100 million to 75 million. They posted a picture on their Instagram account of George Mendez's most valuable clients, which of course featured the guy and his downgrade. He subsequently blotched them, meaning they could not tag him in their post. Everything from a player's contract duration, the name of their agent, their injury susceptibility and record, the positions that Marouane Fellaini has played in throughout his career and how many games he played in each of those positions and when, my goat. Here's where things get a little tricky. Here's Marouane Fellaini again, and here's his market value over time. It sits at 1 million euros. Harsh for the goat but that's a debate for another day. Now, that's what he's worth, right? A lot of people would say so. The only problem is that this value is determined by volunteers. The New York Times interviewed Transfer Market's managing director, Thomas Lintz, back in 2020, where he spoke on the valuation system on the site. Someone will point out that this player has won a higher percentage of headed jewels than another player, so should be worth a little more. When he says someone, he is of course referring to the over 50,000 plus active members that help formulate the eventual values we see when we load up the website. On screen are just some of the factors that these users will consider when suggesting why values should be what they are. It's essentially a fan vote. Now, certain clubs are using these values in some shape or form. These are estimates that are based on crowdsourced opinions. I will say this, I have gone through some of the player discussion threads on this website and I gotta admit, there is some pretty constructive discourse that goes on in those, but there's also a lot of the opposite. I just can't shake the feeling that it's kind of like going on Twitter and you know, agreeing with the most liked comment or reply. It's unreal. I am just a social worker. I do this transfer market work for fun and the football industry is worth millions. The contrast is insane. Martin Freundel, transfer market volunteer. Clubs shouldn't make transfer decisions based on the figures on our website. Our method is not scientific. Christian Schwartz, Transfer Market Global Head of Market Values. To be fair, any competent club knows this. Transfers are extremely complex procedures that can astronomically affect the financial future of any organization. You can't leave decisions like that in the hands of someone like me. <laughs> so if clubs don't use these figures to buy players, why do Transfer Market volunteers and employees often talk about how they are offered expensive gifts and dinners by agents and club executives in exchange for a bump in the values they list on the website. I'll tell you why. Propaganda. Olympic Marseille were a club in crisis in 2015-16, finishing 13th. In 2018, they were back to where they were supposed to be and even made it to the Europa League final. Marseille chairman Jacques-Henri Herut puffed his chest out and said, we invested 120 million euros during the last transfer period, and according to Transfer Market, our players are now worth around 200 million euros. So the information on this website is clearly taken seriously. I mean, seriously enough to elicit bribery, and also seriously enough to quote it to demonstrate your organization's success. But are these actual transfer values? In general, the transfer market values are not to be equated with transfer fees. It says it right here on the website itself, and they aren't wrong. Pau Torres, 45 million euro market value on transfer market before the sale, 36 million euros and transfer fees from Villarreal to Aston Villa after that. Jude Bellingham, 120 million MV, 103 million actual. Alexis McAllister, 65 million MV, 42 million actual. So no, it's not an exact science, but people are paying attention. I'm only saying all of this to illustrate the craziness of the market and all the noise that can sway opinions, both public and private. And sometimes, opinions matter more than reality. Right, so, all of this, all of this craziness, 
is this a bubble that is just bound to burst? This is quite literally a question that has been asked for decades. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I did like a semester of economics when I was at uni, so yeah. I am an expert in this field. A financial bubble is caused by the overinflation in the value of assets. The bubble bursts when shareholders are unsure about the direction of the industry, sell their stock at cut prices to recoup costs and dry up the cash flow. A lot of people have compared the European football markets to things like the housing market bubble or the dot com bubble. I guess I can see why. Houses were overvalued, as was the utility of the internet, at the time at least. But what about football players? There is a difference though. House prices and rentals were expected to rise based on speculation. Prices nosedived when eventually nobody could afford what was on offer in the market. It was all an overvaluation. Are football players overvalued in this sense? No. As we saw earlier, the prices of the biggest transfers in the game are representative of a direct reaction to growing revenues rather than speculation. And what's the driving factor for revenue? Broadcasting, commercial, and match day. Us. Our never-ending interest in the game. Our interest is what is driving the increases in prize money, investor funding, and all the rest. For that to change, you're all gonna have to find something different to do on a Saturday afternoon. Unlikely. So long as the powers that be don't price fans out the game, which is... I guess a big so long as, I don't think things will change. In 2020, a paper published by Lucas Richau and three other collaborators in the Journal of Business Economics explored the existence of a speculative bubble in European football. I'm gonna give you all a direct quote from their conclusions, but I highly recommend that anyone interested in this topic give the whole thing a read. As someone that reads a lot of journal papers, this one is very high up there. Although transfer fee spending in recent years does meet the typical pattern seen in historical bubbles, the case of football rather resembles an atypical bubble. This is because the rise in transfer fees for most clubs is largely backed by cash inflows, prompting an elevator effect for transfer fees. Typical bubbles on the other hand, contain heavy debt financing in the absence of respective and sustainable cash flows. In the same paper, they also propose that the football market has been undervalued for quite some time and what we're seeing now is simply just the inevitable. It's worth noting that financial crises and companies going under is nothing new and it's by no means an indicator of a bubble more than it is of financial mismanagement. Now some clubs do need to be concerned, particularly those in Italy and France. Back to Deloitte's 2023 finance review and on screen we have the wage bills to revenue ratios for clubs in the top five leagues. UEFA suggests a critical wage to revenue ratio threshold of 70%. In 21-22, Serie A and Ligue 1 were on 83% and 87%. Serie A was the only league to record a decrease in revenue too. Both leagues are far behind their contemporaries in terms of all forms of revenue. There's a reason why you'll always see articles about the Milan clubs or PSG who do not own their stadiums looking to move and break ground. In fact, most teams in those leagues don't own their stadiums. Perpetual rentals mean they couldn't possibly make as much as those in Germany and England for match day sales, for example. This is concerning, but these clubs aren't the only ones that should be concerned. While the Premier League and all the big boys are enjoying massive cash inflows, we all know from experience that all it takes is one little pesky world-bending event to make everything become shaky. COVID was by far the biggest stress test for the football industry. In March of 2022, leagues around the world were suspended in the wake of the crisis. To a lot of people, this was the bubble burst. Players weren't allowed to play games. No games equals no broadcasting. People weren't allowed to go to stadiums. No people equals no match day sales. And with that, the world of football was sent into turmoil. Some leagues will understand that money is nothing that is coming automatically every month from heaven. Christian Seifert, a Bundesliga executive. Large broadcasters were choosing to defer payments as the product that was promised was not being delivered. It was widely reported that the Premier League in particular stood to lose over a billion pounds in the event that the season was not concluded. Over 760 million of that was said to be a direct result of TV revenue loss. Clubs were panicking, putting staff on furlough payment schemes, wage cuts and deferred payments were negotiated across the board. At some point, there was talk of concluding 
during the Premier League season in China when it was believed that they were handling the situation better. It was a mess. However, the season did continue and did conclude, and in the years since, the football industry has seen nothing but growth. You'll all remember this chart from the very beginning of the video. Again, that is an all-time high. Maybe this industry is bulletproof. No, no, this industry isn't bulletproof. Football survived COVID as a whole for the most part, but like many businesses in general, many footballing organizations suffered heavily. A lot of them are still suffering heavily as a result of that to this very day. As a whole, the game goes on. But who knows for how long? The brightest legal and financial minds on the planet are employed by these clubs to make them as disaster-proof as possible. When you consider COVID especially, there is no doubt in my mind that a vast array of contingencies have been thought of in the event that things get turned upside down again. But at the same time, it's only the biggest clubs in the world that are able to afford these mines. And also, you can't plan for everything. Maybe there's another world-altering event. Maybe owners run out of cash. Look at China. And maybe more fittingly, look at Saudi Arabia. If the PIF decides to switch up their strategy, it's tickets. What about the players themselves? Players at the highest level play at the very least two games a week. With advances in modern medicine and strength conditioning, players are playing longer, but the human body does have a limit. UEFA and FIFA officials continue to advocate for more games to be played so that they can sell more games to broadcasters and more tickets to us. A hyper successful team could end up playing around 65 games this season if they go all the way in every competition. Then there is a UEFA Euros Championship at the end of the year. The players will suffer. And surprise, surprise, the players are the content. Any change of philosophy that could potentially affect the player's ability to perform could have unbelievably terrible consequences. A Super League could come back to plague us. I'd like to remind everyone that Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Juventus are still attached to this project. I mean, yeah, we all know what's actually going on. If this does happen and they actually follow through with it, we'll just be seeing even more zeros being added to the crazy figures. Those zeros will only be going to a small group of teams though. Would this cause fans to stop watching like many threatened to do when all of this was going down? How will this affect the bottom line? Anything could happen. Anything could go wrong. There are so many scenarios that everyone, me, you, and all the brightest minds in the world couldn't even begin to think of that could cause this 30 billion euro industry to collapse. This whole thing is fascinating. Maybe there is a bubble. Maybe it doesn't matter. Whatever's going on, something tells me we haven't seen anything yet. And there we have it. If you made it this far, you're the real MVP. Absolutely loved putting this one together. Definitely want to do more videos on football finance and the whole industry as a whole, so you can watch out for those in the future. Let me know what you guys think about the state of this crazy industry. Um, all the socials are in the description. Feel free to follow those. That's all for me today. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you're having a great day. Cheers, and I will catch you in the next one.